Director of Government and Diplomatic Programs at the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. We are delighted to welcome Carolina Trevelli to our platform to deliver the annual Gus Hart Lecture. I would like to extend a special thank you to Margaret Hart and the members of the Hart family for so generously supporting the Hart Fellowship for 15 years. For nearly a century, the Chicago Council on Global Affairs has provided an independent and nonpartisan platform for a variety of different voices to promote deeper global understanding and active U.S. engagement in the world. We convene leading global voices, conduct independent research, and engage the public in the discourse on critical global issues. Views expressed by individuals we host are their own and do not represent institutional positions or views of the Council. We also have some exciting programs coming up on our calendar. On October 18th, Australian Ambassador Joe Hockey will discuss the Australian perspective on the United States and Asia. This will be followed the following day on October 19th by a lunch program with Martin Lusteau, the Ambassador of Argentina to the United States. And on October 24th, we will host a symposium on the rise of populism around the world. Turning back to tonight, please note that this event is on the record, so please feel free to use social media, and we are live streaming this program. Also, please remember to silence your phones. After remarks, I will return to the stage to moderate the question and answer session. And now, I would like to welcome Kitty Lansing to the stage for some remarks on behalf of the Hart family. Ms. Lansing is the daughter of Gus Hart, and she serves on the Council's Women and Global Development Steering Committee. Thank you. I guess I better put them on. Thank you, Matt. On behalf of my mother, Margaret Hart, it's a pleasure to be here and to welcome all of you and to say a few words about the Gus Hart Visiting Fellowship, now in its fifth year. In June 2001, our family started the Gus Hart Annual Lecture Series in memory of my father, who passed away in 1999. A dad was chairman and longtime member of the board of the then Chicago Council on Foreign Affairs, and he had a distinguished business career at the Quaker Oats Company. It was while building the international division of Quaker, or Quaker Oats, that dad developed what eventually became a lifelong curiosity, passion, and commitment to Latin America. He traveled and operated food businesses in nearly every corner of Central and South America. Also, in the late 60s and early 70s, he was an active and early board member of the Inter-American Foundation, created as an independent government agency to fund development projects undertaken by grassroots groups and NGOs in Latin America uh, and the Caribbean. So from a business, social, and economic perspective, Dad was well acquainted with Latin America. Since evolving from an annual lecture series to the visiting fellowship that it is today, the Hart Fellowship continues its focus on strengthening relations between Chicago and Latin America. This year marks the 10th visiting fellow from Latin America who is contributing to the advancement of society through economic, political, and social reform. Integral to the visiting fellowship is the insightful and dedicated members of the Hart Fellowship Selection Committee. I am delighted that Abe Lowenthal, an irreplaceable member of the selection, of the selection committee, is here tonight. Abe has decided to step down from the committee after nine years of service. And on behalf of our family and the Council on Global Affairs, we would like to express our deep gratitude and recognize his crucial role in helping shape the success of the fellowship program. I'd like to invite Abe to the podium to introduce our 2016 Hart Fellow. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Kitty, for the personal remarks you made. I want to thank you and uh, your mother, Mrs. Margaret Hart, Rob Lansing, and the rest of the Hart Selection Committee members who are with us tonight. Uh, it's a special pleasure to be here uh, today, partly because we have a Hart Fellow from Peru, a country where I spent uh, 
three years and where my son spent the first three years of his life, but also to share the joy with all of you of meeting in this wonderful space. Uh, I've been around institution building uh, and I really don't know of another organization that has been blessed with three successive leaders in John Riley, who's with us today, Marshall Bhutan and Ivo Dalder, and the uh, fruits of the work they have done with their board and with their members and members of the community is particularly evident in this wonderful uh, move to this, to this building. It's been an enormous personal pleasure to be part of the dream team committed to building meaningful and lasting bridges between Chicago and Latin America. Latin America is becoming ever more important to the Midwest and to the United States as a whole. Not because of national security crises, but because of the many ways that our capacity to deal with important issues in this country, both international and domestic, is affected by Latin American countries and their citizens. Our selection committee has been able year after year to identify and attract to Chicago extraordinary Latin American leaders. Just to cite two examples, Sergio Jaramillo has been the key strategist in the extremely important efforts to negotiate an end to Colombia's long insurgency. He was the strategist of these uh, peace discussions, which we all hope will eventually come to a good and positive conclusion. In Venezuela, Enrique Capriles is the most likely presidential candidate for those who oppose that country's increasingly authoritarian government. Carolina Trevelli, our Hart Fellow for 2016, is another visionary and extraordinary leader. She began her career in 1991 as a researcher in the outstanding social science research center of Peru, the Instituto de Estudios Peruanos, Institute of Peruvian Studies. She became director of that institute in 2001 and continued over several years to strengthen its contributions. In 2011, she was appointed the first Minister of Development and Social Inclusion a newly created cabinet position in the Peruvian government. She worked closely with other ministries to develop and strengthen social inclusion programs in a country with major, deep, ethnic, social, and economic cleavages. She has been widely praised for her ability to implement rigorous evaluation, replace programs that were not working, preserve those that were, and pioneer new models for example, in early childhood education. Since leaving the ministry, Carolina has been heading a nationwide e-money initiative called Pagos Digitales Peruanos, which I'm sure she'll mention briefly in her talk. As a recognized thought leader, she has been invited to advise the consultative group to assist the poor, a very important international initiative, and the Global Innovation Fund hosted by the World Bank. Carolina continues to conduct research at the Institute of Peruvian Studies. She publishes a weekly op-ed column. She has operated in the public and private sectors, in academia and in non-governmental organizations, in advisory and in executive positions. She has worked and continues to work constantly and effectively, both to analyze and to confront Peru's embedded problems of inequality exclusion, and weak institutions. Please join me in welcoming Carolina Trevelli, the 2016 Gus Hart Visiting Fellow, an active social entrepreneur in the tradition and spirit of Mr. Hart. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to the Hart family for bringing me here, for giving me this chance to talk to you this afternoon. Uh, thank you for the uh, to the council for giving me the opportunity and to Abe for his kind words. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here and to have the chance to share with you some of my views on what's going on really today in, in Peru. 
Peru, as you may know, it's a great country. It's really a great country. It's a medium-sized country. It's a country with a relatively young population. With a, it's a highly diverse country in terms of culture, geography, climate, uh, cultural uh, issues, and has a recent story that could be considered a story of success. And I want to share with you why we think this is a story of success, but also share with you what are the challenges that a country, a successful story country like Peru is facing today. Let me begin with a little bit of context and history. Peru went back to democracy in year 1980. After several years of dictatorship, uh, we went back to democracy, struggling with a lot of new challenges as a country. Uh, during that decade, the 80s, we faced two major issues affecting what became after serious problems in the country. We faced an internal armed conflict that ended only in 1992. Uh, the conflict was uh, finally ended that year. The Shining Path leaders are still in prison. And we as a society are still struggling to understand why we had such a major conflict that killed more than 70,000 Peruvians. In year 2001, we create a truth commission to really understand what really happened to us during that period. What were the causes that allow us as a country, as a, as a society, accept to confront such a major conflict? The results of that commission were very hard to process, and we're still in that process today. But one of the things that was made clear was that that conflict happened because there were places in the country, there were groups in our society, there were groups of Peruvians that were completely invisible to the state and to major social groups. These invisible groups faced extreme exclusion and poverty, and around those groups, the war was even more devastating. But we only noticed that, that devastation, when that war became part of our daily lives in the major cities. The rural-urban gaps, the indigenous and non-indigenous gaps, are, part, are a relevant part of the causes of that internal armed conflict. Inequality is a major issue in Peru. Rural poverty is more than four times urban poverty rates. We are an, an unequal country in several dimensions, not only in economic terms. We really face a lot of inequalities that reinforce one to each other. And that is one of the main challenges we need to address. Together with the war, during the 80s, our economy was completely destroyed. We got a hyperinflation, we had an external crisis, and the larger poverty increase in decades. We began year 1990 with a new government with 7,000% of inflation rate that year. So by the beginning of the uh, early 90s, Peru was not a promising country. We didn't have any uh, vision that we could do well, that we could really have a good economic uh, policy and that we could really uh, overcome the war and the economic crisis. But countries can change. Democratic powers can really move things forward. And that's one of the main lessons we get from the Peruvian experience. My country is still facing enormous challenges. And we are facing, again, some major dilemmas today that, uh, where we think we are in a new crossroad. And we need to make some major decisions in the country to keep this change being positive for most Peruvians. Peru today represents a story of success, as I was saying. The last decade is a, dec uh, it's a very successful decade. Uh, I want to highlight two major successes that we could find in our recent history. First, our economy is completely recovered. Amazingly as it sounds, in very short period of time, our economy now is a very sound economy. We have been having economic growth for 15 years, 
very high economic growth, more than 6% per year per, in average. And also, in a, the slowdown in that rate we are facing today due to a, a change in economic uh, external conditions, we still, this year, we're going to grow near 4%. We have sound, pol sound macroeconomic policies, we have fiscal sustainability, we have very little external debt, and that is why we are able to keep this uh, growing while facing our uh, stronger external shock in the last 65 years. However, we also have learned during this period that growth is very helpful, it's very important, but it's not enough to solve all our challenges. The, other, the success story of our economy has also challenges to face. We are still uh, an economy that is highly dependent on uh, the, the extractive industries, mainly mining, gas, and oil. Uh, and those industries generate several significant social conflicts among, uh, around them. We also need to find a way to diversify our economy and to become less dependent of our exter external partners, which some of them are not performing very well today, like Brazil. Several tasks need, need to be implemented to address these challenges. Our economy is a strong economy, it's a sound economy, but still needs a lot of work to do to really have a completely sustained uh, economic growth process. Peru managed to have something very special, and this is the second part of this success story I want to share with you, and got something that we could call inclusive growth. In the last decade, the economic growth and the uh, right in place policies, not only social policies, but uh, several policies, allow us to reduce the poverty rate amazingly rapidly. In year 2005, 55% of the population was living below the poverty line. In year 2015, only 10 years after, 22% of the population lives in poverty. So a major decrease in poverty, and we are very near to eliminate, to eliminate extreme poverty, hunger. So that's a major achievement for a country in a very short period of time. 10 years ago, the majority of Peruvians we're living in poverty conditions. Today, the majority of Peruvians live in an emerging, vibrant middle class. Highly vulnerable, but middle class. During these years of sustained growth, the incomes of the poorer 40% poorer of the population grew more than the overall economy, favoring the emergence of this newly created middle class. Our recovered fiscal accounts allow the country to begin investment in investing in infrastructure and in the improvement of public services to begin really finally serving the traditional invisible groups of society. Are we done with that? No, we are very far away of being done, but we have done major progress. We have a long way to go to be able to reach the minimum living standards that we require. We need to keep investing to ensure that every Peruvian will receive the basic services and will access opportunities to be able to contribute to the country's development. Today we recognize, and that has been a major uh, learning of these uh, interesting years, that there's, a, there's an interdependence between economic and social policies. None of them could be done alone without taking in account the others. We cannot achieve development if the economic benefits of growth are not shared by all Peruvians. And we need to be able to allow every Peruvian to contribute to our nation's development. For that promise to be real, we have a lot of work to do. This means in concrete terms that we need to be able to achieve as a country that every Peruvian girl, no matter where she was, she's born, no, no matter the amount of money their family has, the education level of her parents, and the, or the language she speaks at home, she will be able to er exercise her full rights, she will be able to be a full citizen, and she will be able to take advantage of all the opportunities a country, a successful country, should offer to her. To move from where we are now to that future, 
with development and social inclusion, we need to do a lot more. Not just achieve more growth, not just have good social policies. We need to have a sustainable country. The challenges are becoming every single day more complex to achieve. Every single day, the things that we need to do are more complicated, require more consensus, and a lot of political will. And we need to get ready to address those problems. As I said, inequality is the major issue we have to address in the country. And it's not only about income inequality. It's about several inequalities acting together, overlapping, reinforcing each other. These multiple inequalities trans translate into social and political risks, but also into enormous social and economic gaps. Urban are very different from rural opportunities. The rich and the poor face completely different opportunities for their lives. The Amazon region faces completely different set of feasible economic activities than the coastal region. Lima seems to be a different country from the rest of the country. If you are born woman in the Amazon basin, in a poor household, your chances to become successful to go to higher education are far away below than the chances that a white Limenian boy will have. So we need to correct that. That's the role for the state and for a country to become accessible and sustainable. Changing that is part of the agenda that we have today, and it's a very complex agenda. Today, our main problem to sustain our growth and economic development is our precarious institutional development. Weak institutions, weak rule of law, absence of political parties, lack of accountability of public offices are part of the expression of that. This translates into a highly informal economy. 70% of our economy works outside the formal channels. You don't have a contract, you don't pay taxes, you don't have a license to operate. But also you don't have social protection, you don't have access to uh, good quality health services. Uh, this informality increases the levels of insecurity and uh, allow us to move instead of to a steady path of preserving our democracy to volatile and risky electoral processes. Corruption is a major threat in our country due to the lack of strong institutions. In, ab in absence of solid and sound institutions, it seems very unlikely that we will be able to solve corruption. And we, we won't be able to face the growing power of Ill illegal economies. In our country, sadly, we have the presence of drug trafficking. We have illegal mining. We have mining in protected areas that are consuming our Amazon diversity. We have uh, illegal timber uh, lodging, and uh, that is really affecting not only the economy and the institutions of Peru, but it's affecting the world. We need to do something about that. If we do not, if we do not tackle our institution weakness, we could lose all that what, what we have achieved by now. But institutional change, it's nice to say, but it's, it's very difficult to achieve requires strong democracies and sound political and social actors, requires building consensus based on dialogue, and requires the creation of time frames that allow those institutional reforms to take place. Patience, it's required, and that is not something very simple to achieve as a society. How we should promote it? How are we gonna move from here to really make an institutional change in our country that allow us to sustain our, this success story. For sure, the economic actors are seeing today the limits to economic growth because of the, because of the lack of uh, good and strong institutions. Civil society and social groups are beginning to work on how to support institutional change, but we need to do more. We need to really get political engagement, citizen movements to support the reforms, that are very hard to implement and are not very sexy for the public opinion. There, here we are now. If we do not make the right detour today and implement major institutional reforms, our achievements will become 
a nice piece of history, a nice episode in our history. But we will not be able to move from this nice episode, from this nice story, to a sustained trend to move forward development. So we cannot take the luxury just to keep watching this situation and not do anything. So how we move ahead, and that's why I'm here, I think. I will use my personal story to try to tell you how everybody should do its part in this uh, very complex issue. I began my career, as Abe was saying, doing applied research in a think tank because I'm convinced that evidence, good diagnostics, informed debates are key to unlock the process of change. After 20 years doing research, I was appointed as Minister of Development and Social Inclusion. I was scared to death when, with that responsibility, but find out that it was a great opportunity to test if my research, if my experience uh, trying to understand social phenomena and the proposal I had made for those 20 years were useful and feasible. I had the chance to build a new ministry devoted to ensure that all Peruvians will be able to exercise their rights and that opportunities will be available for all of them. We are not there yet, for sure. That was only five years ago. But major progress has been done. Public sector offices has, have a m major and important power to really make big changes happen in very short period, periods of time. Large scale, it's something we require in the changes we're trying to promote. So we really need the engagement of the public se sector. However, public sectors are not very good in being creative, being innovative, and learning fast. So they need to partner with researchers, with civil society organizations, with private sector institutions to keep introducing changes, to keep having new ideas, to keep improving their goals. They need proven concepts to take them to scale. During my time in office, we recognized, for example, that there was no possible sustainable social inclusion without economic inclusion. But how we can really help the ultra poor households to engage in prosperity and economic uh, inclusion? We designed several interventions, some of them still in place and are successful, some had to be revised. But my favorite, was the, my favorite one was to support financial inclusion. And at the beginning, that sounds very far away of an ultra poor household. Why financial inclusion could be really helpful for a very poor household, which main characteristic is that they don't have enough money. Uh, but I will give you an example just to illustrate why financial inclusion was so important and was part of the examples of the simple things that you can do to really change the life of the people. Imagine a rural mother that receives a social transfer every month. She receives a very small amount of money, in average $30 per month. That helps a lot that uh, ultra poor household to really engage in a sustained path of consumption, provides a lot of, of security, and allows this poor woman to begin having some stability in her incomes. The main problem of the poorer households is not that they don't have enough money, but they don't know if they will have it tomorrow. So having something stable helps a lot. She now, after our program to favor financial inclusion, receives those same $30. But instead of receiving the cash, she, she receives a deposit in a savings account. It's a free of charge savings account, and it's a transactional account, actually, where she can uh, take out the money when she needs it. She can leave some portions of the money there. She can divide the transfer into installments and begin thinking on what is the best moment to use their money. The other good thing about the deposit is that her husband cannot take the money out. That's very important. And she can, be, be, she can use wisely that money based on their pref her preferences and based on what is valuable for her. 
Her life changes when she be begins realizing that she can save. And it's not that she's going to save an enormous amount of money. She doesn't have much resources. But she can begin budgeting, planning, and saving to achieve major things that are important for her and for her household. For example, to test this new tool, I heard this story several times, and I uh, like to share this example because it's very illustrative. She can, I, I heard the story about several women in October, like this month, they begin leaving in, their, in her account five soles. That's 5% of her transfer. That's a lot. Every single month, they will take out only 95 soles of the transfer and leave their five soles. Why? Because in March, the first day of school, her daughter will go to school with new shoes. And that's something that will empower this woman, that will allow this woman to have a different relationship with her family, with their community. Uh, uh, allowing this woman to make that simple decision, to make that planning, to make that evaluation of the future, it's a major change in the mindset of a poor family. And that is why financial inclusion is so useful. Financial inclusion allows people to have better protection systems and also allow them to have better opportunities. After saving for the new pair of shoes, they could also begin saving to have a small business, to buy a couple of hens, to improve her quality of life. Planning, budgeting are really important things that we do all the time and most of the poor families in the world are not allowed to do. Now she, she's proud. She can save, she can make decisions, she can manage her money. And that is the first step for empowerment. And that is something really important for poor people, especially when you begin thinking about the future. Providing a simple financial tool opens a major change in the lives of the poor. Financial inclusion helps protecting the poor and at the same time helps them accessing productive opportunities. Small changes, simple tools, existing tools can drive major social changes. With this experience, when I left the public sector, the private sector, the Peruvian Bankers Association, can you imagine, it's big banks there, asked me to join them to build a financial inclusion initiative driven by uh, the financial industry. Finally, the private sector was reacting, saying, well, if this is true and this is working, how the financial sector can work and support financial inclusion. It was like music to my ears. We began working using new technologies to build a shared infrastructure with more than 30 financial institutions aiming to help financial inclusion in the country. This was because of the good reasons. Better financial inclusion allows better businesses, better economic growth, less inequality, a lot more opportunities, and that means also a lot of new clients for the financial sector. So that was a win-win situation. We worked for more than three years in preparing that program. That is working now. We went to the market with this new system using very uh, traditional old-style feature phones to work to make transfers, to get connected, uh, to connect the financial sector with the poorer families in the country. And that is moving ahead. And based on that new system, a lot of poor households will now have access to financial tools. Today, I am moving back to my origins. I'm going back to my old uh, position in a think tank to keep thinking on how to promote changes to ensure that our country will still be a success story. I am by nature very optimistic, and I think that as a country, we will find a way forward. But I, but I know for sure that it's not gonna be easy or without controversy and debate. Everybody needs to do a piece. And in my journey, in my professional journey, I learned that in every place you can do your part. We all need to engage in this challenge. I myself, I'm going back to research as I was saying. I will continue to work to create and use the knowledge to build arguments to support these social inclusive processes and the need for institutional reforms. 
but I am also an entrepreneur. I'm focused in promoting financial inclusion to help the underserved to obtain the tools they need to succeed. I will keep my work and support to this shared e-money platform to allow every Peruvian to get access to the financial sector through their basic old-fashioned prepaid phone. And also, I will still be an activist. We'll, we all need to advocate for the changes that would bring us sustainability in the widest possible meaning of the term as a country. I know the power of mobilizing the public sector, but also know how civil society, organized citizens, and private sector can reinforce and induce changes. So that is why I work with a civil society organization today that last year has launched a plan to help the implementation of 32 key reform, key institutional reforms, how to improve our judiciary system, how to improve the way in which we elect our authorities, and how to improve the way in which the authorities work with us, govern us. us. Uh, this uh, plan, formed by 32 key reforms, it's a proposal made by 50 so civil society leaders with different backgrounds, with different political ideas, but we got the consensus on these 32 reforms. These are 32 key reforms to help our country to move forward in this, uh, in this moment. We hope we will be able to move a little bit the decision and the political will to begin this reform process. Today, we are advocating to get 50,000 uh, signatures uh, to support this plan from different groups in society to allow the Congress to uh, discuss these reforms. We need to prove that at this crossroad, we have options. That as a country, we can go everywhere we decide to, and we need to do that collectively and democratically. We have opportunities, several. Today, we could be the generation in Peru to end extreme poverty, to reduce inequality, and to consolidate our democracy. For that, we need to be smart and assertive to take the right detours. This is the crossroad where we are standing today. We either go through the difficult and slow, probably painful process of working for stronger institutions, or we keep doing the best we can with what we have and accept a probably increase in inequality, unfairness, unfairness and injustice. All this, all the situation we are facing today, if we don't do, if we don't take that major detour, will set a cap to our economic growth and especially to our social progress. Social inclusion is a major achievement of the country and we need to transform that in development. We even may go back if we don't do the institutional reform we require. And we don't, we still have in our minds the story of our internal conflict, and we don't want to go back there. So I, need, I think we all need to stand up and do what we need to do. We will take the right direction for sure, but it's not going to be simple and it's not going to be fast. So stay tuned to our future development, and I thank you for your attention on, and your interest in a great country like Peru. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Trevelli, for your remarks. We have time for some questions from the audience now. If you do have a question, please raise your arm and I will call on you. A member of our staff will then bring a microphone to you. Please also make sure your question is a question and not a statement. <laughs> yes, please. Um, in the black. Hi, um, I have a quick question. Is there a way to find out a little bit more about how you are implementing this new process you're saying that you're working with a few different uh, bank institutions in your in your country, and I'm just a little curious how you're able to actually access those folks that are in the more remote locations and get them involved in the process, how that's done, especially through, it looks like it's through digital pay, so I'm really curious about that. Yes, actually, 
uh, you can visit the web page of our, our initiative. It's uh, M-I-B-I-M, because our wallet is called BIM, so my BIM, me BIM, dot P-E. And, and you can get there a lot of information on what we are doing. And it's a very interesting initiative because it's a collaborative initiative by more than 30 financial institutions. They are not very used to collaborate, actually, but they are learning. Uh, but it's a collaboration that will allow them to compete for this new set of clients. In Peru, only three out of every 10 adults works with the financial sector. So that other 70% of the population now, mostly in the middle class, it's a very attractive potential set of customers. Yes, please, in the second row. Yes, thank you. And uh, microphone's on its way. Thank you. Um, I can see that you put women in, women in the center of really rise, raising the level of marginalized people, and interesting that you choose the financial uh, component. I, I, I know a lot of uh, groups look at education as a key issue, and I'm mm -hmm. wondering what the status of education, particularly women, is in Peru, and what are some of the challenges and how they're being met. Thank you. Actually, we have um, universal coverage of public education up to the, for sure for primary education and mostly for higher, for up to secondary education. Uh, however, the main challenge is quality. We don't have the best quality in, in there, but we are improving. Uh, for women, there, there is a gap in accessing uh, basic education, and that's why we are working with uh, our conditional cash transfer program to ensure that every girl will go to school up to the last year of, of high school as, as a requirement to be part of that program. And that has uh, been very transformational, especially in rural areas where most of the girls were left behind. Not anymore. Yes, please, on the outer edge. Hi, you mentioned that there are a number of interventions. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about the interventions that, or one intervention that failed and what you learned from it. <laughs> um, when we uh, got into the ministry, we realized that the more excluded populations of the country, uh, also if we do several interventions to help them in their way f through uh, economic inclusion, if they don't have the minimum set of infrastructure, they will fail. You know, you need at least to have water, sanitation, electricity, and communications, a road or a phone or something, if you want to become economically viable. Uh, and we made a study and find out something very dramatically. When we looked at the five million more excluded Peruvians, uh, only 9% of them had joined access to water, sanitation, electricity, and communications. So it's almost impossible to become economically viable if you don't have at least this basic set of services. Uh, so we create a program in which we could identify the gap in each town, so what part of this mini set of infrastructure was missing, to ask the rest of the government to go there and fill that gap so we could increase that. That didn't work that well, actually, because you know we got money from the Ministry of Economic and Finance to pay for that infrastructure. But you know, the people I work with lives very far away, lives in very small towns. So you know, the Ministry of communication said, well, you know, I cannot put an big antenna if there are, no, there are less than 10,000 people. So I don't, I don't mind if you have the money to pay for this, but it's not my business. So that was really a major problem. After four year, five years, we increased the number of people in this extreme poor people accessing this type of basic combo of infrastructure to 26%. And it was a major achievement. But it's, you know, it's so slow. 
it takes forever. <laughs> so we still had a lot of work to do there. We need to find a way to do it in a more attractive way. Yes, please, in the blue sweater in the back. Hi. Um, I know that um, you talked about the you know, $30 a month of welfare for rural communities. Um, I was just wondering um, where most of that money was coming from, um, especially if 70% of your um, economy is you know, informal and there's not a whole lot of sales tax <laughs> revenue coming through. So I was just wondering maybe where that came from. Um, one important thing in Peru is that all our social programs, all our social interventions are financed with money of the public budget. No donations, no uh, cooperation money, it's taxpayers' money. Uh, we have a highly informal economy, but we have also a highly dependent in, uh, economy from these extractive industries, and they pay a lot of taxes. <laughs> Uh, yes, please, in the fourth row. Ms. Trebelli, I'm inspired by you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so what do you think is the role of insurance in our country? It's a crucial service, you know. Uh, I began my work as a researcher working in rural finance and rural development. and. We will never change the landscape of rural development if we cannot take risk out of rural communities. And the only way to do that is through insurance. But rural insurances are very complicated. And in, in Peru, the insurance industry is in the prehistoric era. Only less than 5% of Peruvians have, a, have bought some sort of insurance in their lives. So the insurance companies only are worried about the 10% richer in the country. So we need to have uh, probably public insurances for the group I'm working with, uh, and that seems very far away in the agenda. But it's crucial. We, what we are having now is that all our social protection programs are acting as an insurance for those families. But that's very inefficient. We should move to a more market-oriented insurance system, but we are far away from that, sadly. Yes, in the black, please. How does reducing the percentage of the informal commerce help uh, grow a program like the financial inclusion program in Peru? Actually, in all around the world, a couple of weeks ago, uh, it was released, a study done by the McKinsey Global Institute with resources from the Gates Foundation, showing that if we reduce, if, if we achieve uh, that 80% of the present excluded, financially excluded people into the financial sector, the global economy could grow 6%. Why? Because you will save a lot of money in terms of transactional cost, in losses. You know, there are several activities that are completely inefficient. Imagine you are the treasurer, uh, treasurer of Sub Miller, and you receive a lot of small pay payments in your truck from every single merchant in a country like Peru. And then that truck has to go to an office with all these bills and coins, and they have like a room like this size and where they only order that money, they count it, and then they have to pay a special service to take all that money to a bank. If you can save that amount of money, all those transaction costs, you will increase the efficiency of any business, not only of the uh, businesses of the poor. So there are several mechanisms, and it's shown now with very sound research that if we achieve financial inclusion, we will increase economic growth, we will reduce inequality, and we will increase economic stability. So that, those are the macroeconomic reasons. But when you move and put you know, the focus on a small uh, household or in a small firm, 
the impacts could be even greater than that because you could change the opportunities of that family. Mr. Lowenthal. Oh, now the tough question. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, I'm going to ask a question that I know is not easy, <laughs> but I'd be very interested in your answer. You emphasized that one of Peru's problems, one of its realities, is weak and vulnerable institutions. Uh, as I mentioned, I lived in Peru for three years, some 40 years ago. I had previously worked in the Dominican Republic, a country with far fewer <laughs> resources yes. than Peru, just objectively, I mean. Um, one of the things that most struck me in Peru at that time was how weak the institutions were and that you couldn't really expect anything to happen in a variety of different spheres. That even in the simplest things like having meetings that are scheduled and to time. begin at a certain time and to end at a certain time, this was a convention that mm -hmm. didn't apply in Peru. We call it hora peruana. <laughs> and then I took my daughter, who was then five, to, the, to learn how to swim in the Academia de Natación Walter Ledgard, <laughs> uh, a private swimming teaching mm -hmm. business. And the parents brought their children at exactly the right time. And they were there for an hour. And at the end of the hour, the parents were there to pick up the children. And I would go home and say, oh, this is amazing, this Walter Ledgard Academy. <laughs> it's an institution that works. It starts on time, it ends on time, and in 10 weeks, all these kids know how to swim. Now, if they can do this, why doesn't it happen in the rest of the society? And it does happen in the Peruvian Central Bank. Mm -hmm. And it happens in the Wong supermarkets. Uh, and it happens in other sectors. Yeah. Why is it so difficult in Peru? Because I think it is special. I mean, I've traveled around Latin America quite a bit. And I think my, my perception is it's particularly difficult in Peru. Why is that? It's a very difficult question because if we knew exactly why it was happening, we have solved it, but we haven't. Um, but I would tend to think that the main problem in, in Peru with those institutions, with these organizations not working, is that you need a force to change each, each of them. There's no general solution. And we are very bad at doing you know, very long tasks. So we can solve the problem of the central bank you know, we have our uh, foreign policy system works perfectly. We have uh, our financial sector works very good. We have an amazing good regulator for financial services. It's proactive, modern, active. It's great. But then you move to the next institution, and it's not. And then you have to begin to work with that institution, and you have to do that one by one. And I think what we need is to really find out some reforms that will help us not solving the problem institution by institution, because we'll never, we will never get there. We need to find the new rules that allow all institutions to move ahead, and that is something we are struggling with. And the main, one main problem there is the weakness of our system of rule of law. You know, you don't have any predictability, predictability about what the judiciary system will, will end with. So it's, it's, it, it's impossible to avoid these random choices they could make. And that will not allow any business really to become efficient, will not allow any public office to perform well. When I got into the cabinet, for the first time, a social sector was setting indicators and goals to allow the 
people to be able to follow what we were doing for the first time. It, it's, it's amazing. We all have to do that. It's part of being a public servant to have that type of accountability. So now you set the rule, it's there. But you need to ensure that there are forces that will allow you to comply with that rule. And I think it's, it's a major change. And that's why in the 32 reforms we are proposing, we have a major set of them regarding the, uh, how to improve the rule of law in the country. Yes, sir, in the second row. Carolina, could you please comment on what has been able to be done on health coverage, one? Yes. And second, to address all these challenges, could you share with us what you see that the private sector role is being, if it's becoming stronger, what's happening with the small businesses creation? Uh, in terms of health, we, we saw a major change in uh, the last five years in, term, in terms of coverage, especially through the public, we call it insurance system, but it's not. It's just an entitlement for people to get access to the public health system. And that improved uh, significantly in the last five years. And now, for example, every child that is born in the country, regardless anything, has access to the health system. And that's a major change. Um, however, we still have problems in terms of quality and you know, having all the inputs and all the specialists we have. We built a, a pension program for the extreme poor elderly. And the major problem we found when we said, well, this is a pension program, but we need to provide access to health services for these elderly people that lives in poverty, extreme poverty conditions. And we turned back to the health ministry and said, well, we need a lot of specialists in different regions to work with us in visiting these elderly people. And they say, well, we don't have people, um, doctors specialized in elderly. Sorry, we only have like in Lima. We cannot help you. So, so there are still a lot of problems, but coverage has been uh, improving a lot. Private sector is a major driver. Uh, and in, we've been seeing an increase in the presence of private sector, but also uh, an increasing engagement of private sector in public issues. And that's a major change. Uh, this, the, the present government that got into office uh, two months ago, it's very pro-business. So they are trying to get the best of this private sector development uh, within, within this uh, period. And, and I think a major role for private sector is, you know, innovation. They know how to do things the public sector cannot do. We, I worked in a, the development of a school feeding program, and you know my goal all the time was I need to be as good as the major uh, companies selling cookies. Because you go to a you know the more remote place in the country, and you always find this package of cookies, and the cookies are perfect. They arrive there somehow, so. <laughs> The government has to do as well as the private sector in that. And we need to learn. We need to collaborate with them. So I think in terms of innovation, there is a major role for private sector to collaborate with uh, public initiatives. Yes, in the green, please. Hi. Um, in rural communities where sometimes um, rural families don't trust the interests of the Peruvian economy because of its connections to the extraction and industries that um, hurt the rural environment. Um, how do you convince families to take part in financial interventions, particularly families that don't want women going after higher education and financial success in general? If you, if you take a service to any community and that service is of value, is useful for something, is solving problems, they will use it. 
if it's a service that it's not bringing any value, yeah, maybe they won't use it. But uh, from what I've seen in most, in, in almost every community, you know, financial services are very valued. Why? Because the poor families use a lot of financial services, but they use very poor quality financial services, informal financial services. You know, if, you, if your way to having an insurance or of saving for the future is to lend that money to a relative that lives in another town so you won't be able to ask for that money back easily. Well, yeah, it could work, but maybe also the relative will go away, won't have the money when you need it, and it's not very uh, trustable. So the, infor the, the poor households used, uses, use a lot of financial services every single day. They need them to survive. So if you bring them a better supply of financial services that are easy to use, that are really uh, simple, they will use them, for sure. <laughs> yes, please, in the second to last row. Um, given that a lot of the revenue is coming from the extraction companies like oil and gas, and certainly it's a very highly volatile industry in terms of prices, which means that probably the revenue to the government is probably volatile. Mm -hmm. So how stable is kind of the output to the poorer regions, or are there times when they're not going to get kind of the check that they're expecting? How much can they expect there to be stability and consistency in those payouts? Yeah, actually we have... Um now we have very sound fiscal policies, and the last three years we've been facing the worst uh, external shock in our history in the last century, for sure. And nothing changed for the vulnerable households. Why? Because we have, in, within these sound fiscal policies, we create special savings to work in these moments of crisis to support the budget. And we have um, a very sophisticated uh, regulation and laws to allow us to accept fiscal deficit up to certain level and to get convergence with the, new, with the potential economic growth process of the country. So it's very sophisticated today and that's why I said we had very sound macroeconomic policies that allow us to think in a sustainable pathway. Also, having this uh, economy that could be affected by external shocks. We have time for one final question. So, yes, please, in the third row. Thank you again for all your comments. Um, this question is regarding uh, housing, like social housing in urban areas. We've talked a lot about the rural areas um, and what innovations maybe Peru has been coming up with. I know um, the 2016 oh, Pritzker Award for Architecture went to the Peruvian yeah. Alejandro Alvera um, for his work with uh, low-income housing. Is there anything that, or maybe that um, innovations that are coming? Actually, uh, uh, you already realize I'm a very rural person, so. <laughs> uh, in the, the housing problems in urban areas are a major problem, especially for this growing middle class. Because, you know, we, had, we have this big tradition of rural to urban migration that they create these uh, small, precarious uh, ways of housing. But the main challenge is how you move those people when they have some resources to uh, a real house. Uh, we have two programs run by the government. One is called Techo Propio that provides a subsidy but also uh, builds a lot of new houses to uh, help this process. And we have another instrument called Fondo Mi Vivienda that, that is, is already working. But the scale of the problem is a lot larger than the scale of these initiatives. So I think the estimate is that the convergence for that, for those two program, those two supply and demand issues, it's gonna be achieved something after 2030. So it's a major issue in, especially 
in um, intermediate cities, Arequipa, Cusco, La Libertad, eh, Trujillo, and Lambayeque. It's a major, major problem today. Thank you very much, Ms. Trevelli. I would like to also say thank you once again to the Hart family for their generous support of this fellowship. And please join me in thanking our 2016 Gus Hart Fellow, Carolina Trevelli. Thank you. Thank you.